Okay, thank you all for coming. And um, since Trish has already made the introductions, uh, I think we can probably just dive straight into this. Um, we're each going to be talking about what the public means and the ephemeral public, whatever that is, from our own particular perspectives as curators, facilitators, artists, or maybe more than one of those particular categorizations. We'll each show some work, we'll have uh, some back and forth, and then certainly we want to leave plenty of time for questions and discussion with all of you. So Michael, take it away. Great, thank you. Um, thanks for coming. We were just having a really, we just all met, so we were having a really great conversation over there. Um, and so it's nice you could join us for it. Um, so, I was asked to be on a panel called The Ephemeral Public, and people have been asking me what that means. Um, it might have something to do with the fact that it's the last day of an art fair. Um, so, I took the title to mean at least two things. First, that our notion of the public or a public is increasingly obsolescent in a period of gradual but intense privatization. And secondly, and I think this is the one that uh, we're probably going to be thinking about the most today, or that I've been thinking about the most, the notion of a public as a collection of individuals that coalesces for a certain duration, for a shared purpose, for example, a performance, or an election, or an art fair, but then disperses. Uh, this public might also be called an audience. And I don't think those terms are the same thing necessarily, but I think they can align. Um, and there are certainly other definitions of public, and um, all three of us come from different vantages, and um, we'll all have our own working definition. Um, I guess this would be my thesis. Uh, one needs a thesis. All art or culture more broadly imagines a public, by which I mean audience, whether vast or minuscule. And I'll show you some examples of that. Um, this is a, a photograph, a documentation of a performance that I was in in 2008. I'm a critic, uh, I teach, and uh, I'm an independent curator. I'm usually not involved in performances, but I got asked by Steve Roden um, to be in this performance of a very seminal performance by happening by Alan Capro from 1959. Uh, and it, we did this at Los Angeles Contemporary Exhibitions in, in LA um, for five nights. And um, so I was, I was just telling Doreen and Adam, it was very strange to find myself all of a sudden performing in front of um, Paul McCarthy and Carolee Schneeman and Yvonne Rayner and my students. Um, but I approached this, uh, when I did it, it seemed like the most marginal thing I had ever done in my life, and it's grown to become something really central to the way I think about everything I do as uh, a scholar. I actually think being in a Capro performance, and Adam is also, was also involved in one of the Capro uh, reinventions or reenactments, however we want to characterize it, in 2008, um, that that's the only way to really know how, it, how the thing works. Anyways, there, there are many things we could talk about in relationship to this. Uh, the thing I wanted to call to our attention is this idea of the audience and the notion of the audience as a participant uh, in Capro's work. And, and in 1959, this piece is really important because um, Capro's almost diagrammatically removing the proscenium of theater. Um, but he doesn't just do away with it immediately. He, he's really almost um, showing you how he's, he's challenging the proscenium. And so he does two things. He, he breaks the, the action in this performance into three discrete rooms, and every audience member was given a ticket to tell him where, where to sit. Um, and he moves the audience into the space of the performance. Um, so there's not a, a real distance between the performers and uh, audience members. Uh, I think these photographs are taken, um, well, obviously it wasn't a full house every night when um, it was done in 1959, but um, you can see the chairs in the space of the, of the performance. Also as a performer, one of the strange and curious things about the performance is that 
I couldn't see everything that was happening at once. So I could hear things that were happening, but at one point Paul McCarthy was squeezing oranges in another room, and I could tell it was happening because people were laughing. Um, uh, but I couldn't see it. So um, it, it raises the, the piece raises interesting questions too. What it meant to you know be participating in something. Um, in 1965, Capra did this piece called Household, um, and it was, uh, it was done at the Ithaca City Dump, which is not your usual place to do uh, artworks, um, but what's significant about this piece is that Capro invited people to come to Household, but there were no spectators that were not also participants. So all of these people that we see are the people who are realizing the artwork and the people who are also its audience. There was no audience outside of this group of people. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about Lee Lozano because I think uh, Lee Lozano is an artist who had largely disappeared um, intentionally in some ways, um, but also in an art historical sense. Uh, she's certainly, um, she's no longer alive, but um, you know, she's, she's reappeared in some ways in terms of uh, you know, commercial sense and art historical sense. Um, but Lozano is an interesting figure for me because she um, was embodied a kind of duality of public and private um, in her own work and the way she was thinking about it. Um, and so uh, and a lot of her work existed as text, uh, things that she would write down and then they would be things that she would do in her daily life. Um, she did a piece called No Grass Piece in 1969 where she tried to not smoke pot for a minute, for example. Um, so there's no real physical uh, object besides a you know, piece of line notebook paper that she wrote on. Um, but this idea of exhibit in public only pieces which further sharing of ideas and information related to total personal and public revolution, and for her, pairing those things was uh, of utmost importance. So here's a statement uh, she read to um, for an open public hearing of the Art Workers Coalition, which was a group that existed in New York in the late 60s. Um, and I'll read it. Um, there can be, for me, there can be no art revolution that is separate from a science revolution, a political revolution, an education revolution, a drug revolution, a sex revolution, or a personal revolution. I cannot consider a program of museum reforms without equal attention to gallery reforms and art magazine reforms, which would aim to eliminate stables of artists and writers. I will not call myself an art worker, but rather an art dreamer, and I will participate only in a total revolution simultaneously personal and public. This is another work from 1969. One of the interesting things about Lozano is how many pieces were happening. Um, simultaneously, uh, and some of them were had a very kind of finite beginning and ending, and some of them um, don't. And so uh, certain works of hers continued indefinitely, perhaps still do in some ways. Um, anyways, at dialogue pieces, uh, she would invite uh, friends, mostly male artists, to come over and have dialogues with her. Um, and so again, this is the evidence of what this piece consisted of, but you know, uh, artists that we think of as very important artists now um, that were part of her scene, Walter Di Maria, uh, Richard Serra, um, uh, Robert Morris, who was a close friend. Um, she kept trying to get Jasper Johns to come over, but he, he wouldn't. Um, but anyway, so, uh, you know, Dialogue Piece has an audience now that we can read this account, but really it was a work that was done for an audience of two, Lee Lozano and whoever was having the dialogue with her. And there's no real record of um, what the dialogue actually consisted of that they would talk about. Sometimes there's a reference to certain circumstances of the conversation that they would have, but not the actual content of it. Um, and this is, uh, to our knowledge, um, this isn't even necessarily, this text, or this piece doesn't really exist as any kind of physical manifestation except this uh, note in uh, one of Lozano's notebooks. Uh, but she did a piece called Dropout Piece where uh, she dropped out of the art world. 
and it continued really until her death uh, in, in the 1990s. Um, and as she said, this dropout piece is the hardest work I've ever done. Um, so, uh, you know, the idea of how audience works in, or how public works in Lila Zahn's work and its relationship to uh, deeply privatized considerations is one that's interesting to me. Um, so, as uh, Trish mentioned last year, I, I uh, curated a show within the NC2 program at uh, Expo, and I called the show Temporary Landmarks and Moving Situations because I was really interested in the complications of trying to do an exhibition in the context of an art fair. Um, I won't show you too many images of it, but uh, this is uh, a work by Roy McMakin that was in the show, and the uh, didactic panel and the map that were up on the opposite wall from where we're sitting. Um, and so this is from my text for this. Site specificity might seem like a counterintuitive notion in the context of an art fair. When I was invited to organize a series of projects for Expo Chicago under the name In-Situ, uh, which is a term that I associate with artists like Daniel Duran in the late 60s, um, I was immediately interested in a contradiction between the assumed fixity often associated with the term site specificity or artists working in situ and the inherently ephemeral, transitory, even destabilizing nature of looking at art in the context of an art fair. Um, I'm just gonna show you one work from them. This is in the lobby. Um, and it's a work by Robert Berry, uh, a work that was realized specifically for this site um, and uh, a text that in some ways seemed to be commenting on the very nature of looking at art in an art fair, um, which is often very spectacular um, in various senses of that word. Uh, and Barry's piece was very kind of quiet and subdued even though it was 90 feet wide and um, uh, took advantage of a really great view. Uh, and, and the title of the work, and the, the entire work read, um, something that is truly momentous but going unnoticed or remarked upon and it could change the way we think about everything. And it was in the lobby with a $100,000 Mercedes, um, which was kind of perfect. Um, anyway, so I was really interested in this idea of um, doing a show at Navy Pier and in this kind of, this is a photograph I took of it, um, I was really interested in um, the notion of the site and what that site actually means. It's not just um, Festival Hall within Navy Pier to me. It really is this very, uh, what we you know, could call the public realm. Um, obviously, it's a public realm that's very privatized in many ways, but um, it's still a space of uh, um, lots of different kinds of people coming together. Um, some of them coming to look at art, and some of them not coming to look at art. This is something I think Doreen will be talking about um, quite a bit um, with her own work. Uh, this is the transporter. Um, so different people have different notions of you know what kind of cultural experiences they want. I think it's important to think about that. Um, so I guess I want to leave us with this question: If art imagines a public what kind of public does it or should it imagine? And, um, you know, maybe it's a question that we will take up. Um, and I'm just going to end with this quote by Willem Barth, which I, I thought about, um, which I really like in terms of how he's thinking about people coming together. Um, and it's from an essay of his called The Rustle of Language. And he's actually talking about um, his experience of going to pachinko gambling halls in, in Japan. Um, but he says, for the rustle implies a community of bodies and the sounds of the pleasure which is working. No voice is raised, guides or swerves, no voice is constituted. The rustle is the very sound of plural delectation, plural but never massive. The mass, quite the contrary, has a single voice and terribly loud. So I like how he's thinking about this plurality or group of uh, people that would come together for a shared purpose. Um, and it has a kind of sound to it. It's the sound that we hear out, outside right now. Um, but that's different than thinking about the masses or um, a 
mass audience. So I don't know. Hopefully that will leave us in a good place. Thank you. Very interesting. Um, my name is Doreen Remen. I'm the co-founder of Art Production Fund. And Art Production Fund is a nonprofit organization that commissions and produces public art projects with the goal of reaching uh, new audiences and expanding awareness and communication between people through contemporary art. So um, our, our main mission is to bring great art and great artists, uh, to make great art and great artists accessible, both physically and intellectually, to the widest audience possible. Uh, we place art where people live and work. Uh, the focus is on presenting projects that can be appreciated on a number of different levels, so that they can be enjoyed by the general public as just uh, almost entertainment, but that they can also be appreciated by and, and be cri critically relevant so that they can be appreciated by uh, critics or art connoisseurs. So when we first started Art Production Fund, we actually didn't have a, an audience in mind. We didn't really uh, know what audience we'd be speaking to. But since then, a number of distinct types of audiences have presented themselves, and they have presented themselves specifically through the projects that we've produced. Um, and now, uh, when we look back on the projects, those projects can be divided into categories. So I'm gonna go through those categories, and through the discussion of those categories, hopefully we can start to see um, these different types of audiences. So the first, um, the first type of projects that we do are site-specific installations. And now in these types of projects, um, there definitely is uh, it's a very distinct art piece and a distinct audience. There's a deliberate relationship between the art and its audience. It's very straightforward and very clear about what the art is and who the audience is. Uh, the audience in, this, in these types of projects is really very much a receiver. They, um, they visit, either they visit the space specifically or they pass by you know, on their way home or, or on their daily, daily life. But in any case, they're invited. They're, the, the threshold for entry is very, very low and everybody is invited into the conversation. So this um, piece, for instance, is by Rudolf Stingel. It's in Grand Central Station. And you know, the artist's intention was that it would be, you know, it could be seen as a minimalist artwork. You know, the biggest minimalist, minimalist artwork ever. On the other hand, you could also see it as just your grandmother's carpeting in Grand Central Station. And these were the conversations that we were hearing, you know, people walking through and saying, you know, this isn't art, it's just carpeting. But in any case, they were engaging with something and opening their minds to something new that could then potentially grow into a relationship with contemporary art. Uh, this uh, next project um, that we've done is called Prada Marfa, and it's on the uh, roadside right outside of Marfa, Texas, that you all know is the, um, is the home of Donald Judd's um, uh, Chinati Foundation. So there is a relationship to modern art, and the artists were dealing with that, um, addressing that relationship. They were also addressing our, um, you know, consumerism and our commodification of everything. It's a very tongue-in-cheek tongue work. You can see it that way, but you can also, uh, visitors and thousands and hundreds of people have um, blogged and written about it in our, in our you know, um, experiencing Prada Marfa is simply this very, you know, weird installation on the side of the road that looks like a Prada store but can't be entered. Everything in this case is, is good. Um, this is a piece by uh, Tim Noble and Sue Webster on Rockefeller Plaza. Again, they're working with um, um, pop culture, embracing pop culture, embracing the spectacle. But at the same time, it is a spectacle. It's an entertaining, you know, steel structure that looks like a fountain with chasing lights. Something that we embrace in these, these two readings and these two kind of um, experiences of this work. Yoshitomo Nara on Park Avenue. And now this, uh, this is a, a, a site that we found. Um, it was an abandoned 
site in Times Square. Uh, it's, it was waiting to be developed, and we convinced the owner to let us put public projects there. So really, it was a few blocks away from um, Times Square, but it couldn't be more different than Times Square. And these projects were really very, um, we've, we've very successful for us because they engage so many people. This, um, the first project is called uh, by David Brooks. It's called Desert Rooftops. And what he was doing here, um, he was, the, the title of the piece is Desertification. And he was addressing the, um, this, um, the term for what happens to nature when um, the land gets overused and is kind of stripped away of all its nutrients. It's, it's, it's called desertification. He was making this formal and conceptual uh, comparison to suburban spa, sprawl. So the kind of desertification of our culture in, you know, in this sprawl and kind of over supersizing everything. And so what the, the uh, landscape of, of McMansion rooftops is meant to look like a sand dune. You know, we had a sign with all of this written, and it's all very fascinating. And people would walk by, and they would say, they would engage the work, they would think that it was actually, they asked us, uh, oh, is this a new nightclub? You know, where's the entrance? Or we put it up around, uh, it was around Christmas time when we put it up, so they had, many people thought it was a kind of Santa's village, and when are we going to, when are you gonna bring the stuff for sale? Like, what's for sale? So and all of these questions were opening up doors and opening up conversations, but at the same time, not, not at all dumbing down the art or anything that was, was being um, presented. Uh, Josephine Mexieper's project on the same lot, um, and then had oil projects that, again, these actually could look like kinetic sculptures, um, calders, they also are a political statement, Josephine's statement for what, you know, how we're treating the kind of violence, um, violent way that we're treating our environment. And people engage them as oil rigs and we're very excited to know that someone had struck oil in Midtown and we're wondering how, what was gonna happen to the rents in the neighborhood now that there's oil in the neighborhood. So, you know, we was on one hand very, um, you know, entertaining and we found it very exciting actually that um, that you could have a project that could be appealing and that could draw attention and excitement on so many different levels. The next type of project that we uh, present are what we call infiltrations. And these are projects that um, that are more, meld more into the fabric of the city. They're more under the radar, they're more blended, they're, they're difficult to distinguish from their surroundings. The audience is more random, uh, more accidental. Uh, projects rely on viewers to notice them. And the audience actually, in this case, becomes more of a collaborator. Um, and they, are the, they need to be the ones that pick the art out from their environment. So this is, um, a project we call Art Ads, and we put um, contemporary, really great contemporary artist images on top of taxi cabs. So here is Alex Katz on top, and Sharina Shot. There's no, there's no branding, and there's no nothing that calls it out as art, uh, unless you, you know, you know what you're looking at, or you could just be uh, pleasant, you know, excited about the the image that you see more uh, Chuck Close and Kehinda Wiley on top. This project is called Mural, Murals um, After Hours, Murals on the Bowery, and it's a project that we do in conjunction with the New Museum. Um, and what it is, it's um, uh, artworks that have been um, commissioned by contemporary artists all over the world that go, are on the roller shutters, but it's completely not viewable during the day, only at night when the shutters come down and the, the street essentially goes to sleep is when the exhibition opens. Uh, it really, it's on the Bowery, so there's a lot of graffiti and it really blends into the neighborhood, but at the same time, you can you know, clearly tell if you know what you're looking at that these are artworks that, or you know, work by artists that you would only otherwise see in museums. Uh, the, the screens in Times Square are also a great site for us. Um, this project is by Yoko Ono. So every, um, every 59th minute, 
the Times Square Alliance gives the screens over to contemporary art. And we were invited uh, to do a project there and we brought Yoko Ono's piece, which said, imagine peace in 24 different languages, you know, animated up on the screen. So this is, an, uh, you know, this is what we had earlier started to talk about, um, you know, the potential to also uh, engage art and, um, you know, really make it have um, an impact kind of in a, in a broader sense and in the, the political world and kind of um, not just in, in a self, self-referential artistic world. Ryan McGinley Art, um, we put, uh, we had about a, maybe, I think it was about two minute videos on the taxi cab TVs that played about on 500 taxi cabs for a month. Ryan McGinley. And we also bring up art to commercial spaces, um, and we, thought, we find this is a very fertile and really very viable and vibrant location and, and way to, um, to get art out there. This is the marquee of the Cosmopolitan Hotel, and it is advertisement you know, running straight through, but every 15 minutes for one minute, we have our project called Pause, and everything pauses for a, a piece of video art. Um, these two artists, Marilyn Minter and um, David Shrigley. Also in the Cosmopolitan, we run a residency, which is in a regular um, room, uh, very public space at the Cosmopolitan. It's right outside all of the restaurants. And um, we invite artists that live there for a month at a time. And they do projects that engage the public. So you can just be walking around, you know, you have no idea that it's happening there, or you can, you know, know about the, the artist and come to see it. But it's a, you engage in an artist's practice, you engage in an art, artwork with the artist. Now the final, um, what we consider a public art project is uh, our products. We created a line of artists um, artist design functional object called Wow Works on Whatever. And basically really great, ama all amazing artists have given us images to put on products. And now in this particular case, we're appealing to the basic rules of product consumption when, when we're discussing an audience. That's our audience is, is someone who's consuming a product. Uh, but here the content is high art images. and. In this case, although the art is very kind of ephemeral and hardly there, the, you know, you don't have an art piece, but the audience is actually a full participant. First, they have to actually consume and they actually have to pay for the item. And second, when they use it, they're actually engaging in a kind of public art conversation. Um, so this might be a stretch, but, but it really has gotten, it has gotten art out um, to a wide audience, and the, these are plates by um, Jeff Koons and Rudolph Stingle, and before that we had did water bottles. These are water bottles. Um, Yoko Ono, Joseph Kasuth, Raymond Pettibone, and Marilyn Minter. So this is just an advertisement for our current project in, in the Jewish Museum with 3S4. They're a, a fashion collective who are doing it. They did an installation at the museum. but. Um, oops. So anyway, that those are really the three kind of um, the three audiences that have developed uh, up until now, and we'll continue to develop projects, and then through those projects, hopefully, reach and kind of define more audiences and reach those audiences um, to really bring great um, contemporary art to everybody. Thank you, Doreen and Michael. And so I'm just gonna show a few examples of Industry of the Ordinary's work. We're a collaborative duo who've been working together for a decade now. We had a major survey of our work at the Chicago Cultural Center from last August to this past February. And I'll show a few of the discrete works, but mostly I'll talk uh, briefly about the way that we structured this exhibition because we didn't want it to be a conventional object-based survey. We wanted to engage 
other artists, curators, uh, and most importantly, the public at large in a whole variety of different ways. So this is a work called Match of the Day 2, uh, and talking about a public, we made this uh, on the Promontory Point at North Avenue Beach in 2005. Very often, uh, we also have been influenced by Alan Capro, and very often our work emanates from a single sentence. So this piece uh, says, Industry of the Ordinary, dressed as young god and old god, play table football first to 100 goals. And so you see us there, this is entirely unretouched. Uh, there's no digital manipulation. A second after this image was made, that wave crashed over us and almost swept us off into Lake Michigan. This is the one piece called Line in the Sand uh, in which one of us has been arrested. So that deals with an entirely different notion of working in public. So uh, it was at the time of the first Iraq war, it was very close to the beginning of our collaboration, and we just drew a line down State Street for a block in flesh-colored Crayola. As you can see in the bottom image, Matt is being confronted by a traffic warden, and in the right-hand top image, you can actually just see there is a policeman on a bicycle following this line down State Street arrives at Matt, asks him what he's doing. He said he's drawing a line on the sidewalk and he is promptly arrested. And the real reason that this happened was that the merchants on this block of State Street decided that we were supposedly interrupting the flow of commerce and uh, had to be stopped. So they called the Chicago Police Department in the end, it's a long story that I won't go into, but in the end, Matt, having been chained to a wall for three hours at District 1 Police Headquarters, ended up talking to these Chicago policemen about the best place to get the pint of Guinness in the city of Chicago, and was released without charge. So, some of the static projects that we've done, such as this that we did for the Nebraska State Historical Society, involve interaction with a very large public. We were commissioned by them to make uh, a permanent work that addressed Nebraska history for their original headquarters building in Lincoln, Nebraska. So over the course of six months, we traveled back and forth across the state talking to hundreds if not thousands of Nebraskans about the way that they viewed their state. We collected all of this information synthesized it and rather than coming up with a conventional timeline that uh, showed great events in Nebraska history, we actually took a much more oblique stance and created 12 subject groups for the 12 glass panels that used to house the diorama of Nebraska history uh, but had been uh, long since disused. Uh, the museum itself had moved down the mall towards the state capitol. And so for us, this was an interaction with uh, a much larger public. It was incredibly important that we engage with Nebraskans rather than sitting doing research ourselves. So this was the facade of the Chicago Cultural Center uh, during the run of the show. We were interested in in some way rebranding that building, the, the venerable building in the center of downtown that, as many of you know, was originally the library, the central library for the city of Chicago. Uh, in the mid 80s, all of the books were moved out and it was turned into the Chicago Cultural Center as a uh, multimedia, uh, multi-audience location for art, music, dance, and other kinds of cultural events. But uh, to the best of our knowledge, the exterior of the building had never been used in an activated way before. And so this phrase, I want to be ordinary, in some ways has become one of our mantras. We've used it in a number of different ways. And obviously it asks uh, a good deal of questions about the way that we view ourselves in the culture, um, particularly in American culture. And we both grew up in England, so uh, even though we've been here for a long time, 
this whole notion of exceptionalism, of uh, absolutely not wanting to be ordinary is something that runs through much of our work. And so for this temporary site-specific work, there were six banners that were installed on this site. And actually, now that we set the precedent, for most shows, there are going to be banners on the facade of this building that in some way or another relate to what's going on inside. So this was a, both the poster and the cover of the catalogue um, for this show, uh, and it was also part of a portrait project that we did that I'll show uh, a couple of images of in a second. One of the most important things for us was dealing with all aspects of the cultural center. And so this was actually a much earlier piece that we made six years before the show opened uh, for another uh, temporary one-night performative uh, event at the cultural center. For this piece, we photographed all of the security guards at the cultural center. Those workers who are usually completely invisible, we wanted in some way to foreground them. Uh, and to make a formal portrait of them. And so when we were invited to do this major survey show at the Cultural Center, this was the first piece that we knew had to be in the show and was the first piece that you actually saw as you walked into the exhibition hall. So another important component of uh, the show was this platform, which was both a conceptual and literal space that also was located directly in the middle of the exhibition hall, that for the six month run of our show, we gave over completely to others, to five other groups uh, or individual artists. This is Jim Zimple's piece, Angle, and he built a completely functional fish pond in the shape of the lakes that he uh, learned to fish in with his grandfather in Minnesota that you see uh, on the left hand side of the, the platform. On the right is a hydroponic cleansing system, and there were 500 bluegills in that pond. And every Sunday for the month that this was installed on the platform, people could sign up to come fishing. And so Jim, as, a, uh, uh, as an avid angler, set the whole thing up for neophytes as well as experienced fishermen. Obviously, it wasn't much of a competition because the fish were right there. Essentially, you drop your hook in, they bite. But then you had to make a decision. They were put into those rolling carts, and at the end of the two hour long fishing expedition, everyone who had caught fish would go in a parade uh, from the cultural center towards the Chicago River. There was a decision that had to be made along the way. Do you stop at the restaurant with which we had set up an arrangement and go in and have your fish killed, uh, skinned, cleaned, and cooked for you? Or do you continue to the Chicago River and release those fish back into the ecosystem? This is a piece by, on the same platform, uh, two months afterwards by Fahim Majid, a local artist who uh, at the time was the executive director of the Southside Community Arts Center, which is one of the oldest institutions in the city. He unearthed a mural by Bill Walker, who was one of the early Chicago muralists in the basement of this building on the south side. And so for his work, he actually brought what was obviously not a complete work, but a partial piece that hadn't been seen in public for 40 years, installed it in that same space and used recycled wood uh, for these bleachers from which you could sit and look at this mural. And then uh, the last piece that was on the platform was a collaboration between the painter Anna Kunz and the choreographer um, Paige Cunningham called One Careless Gesture Away from Destruction. Anna built uh, this movable painted structure that was wheeled around the cultural center. The other thing that was important to us was that we activate as many spaces within that building as possible. So this was underneath uh, the Gar Rotunda, which is a historic uh, Tiffany Dome space. There were several dance performances that took place down in that space. And then 
on the final uh, weekend of the show, she asked the House of Ninja, which is a local voguing group, to come in and perform on that same platform using the painted um, and carpeted uh, backdrop. Um, and then after they gave their performance, they actually did a voguing workshop uh, in the space for anyone that wants to participate. Because we're running short on time, I'm just gonna jump forwards a bit. This is the Portrait Project, which was uh, a show within a show at the Cultural Center. This was a different kind of engagement um, with the public. In this case, the public was our community of artists in Chicago. We asked 72 Chicago-based artists to make our portrait that we then hung, obviously, totally salon style in this uh, discreet space that had been built just for this project. Everyone from Kerry James Marshall and Nina Guamanglano Vae down to artists who had just graduated from grad school. So it was an overwhelming space, particularly as you can imagine for the two of us to walk in and see 72 representations of us confronting us in all imaginable media uh, and execution styles. And then finally, as another exterior component of the show at the Cultural Center, we were actually finally able, after four years of planning, to execute a piece called The Harvest, which we originally conceived uh, at the time of Obama's uh, first election. We wanted to make a butter sculpture of the president and wheel him through the city. And uh, because of the way that the show was funded, we were actually finally able to execute this. For those of you who aren't from the Midwest, you may not be familiar with the long tradition of butter sculptures at state fairs, but they have been a staple for over a century at state fairs. Um, usually, originally it was a butter cow, but in the last couple of decades, popular culture has been absorbed in there, and there was actually a sculpture of Obama and McCain shaking hands in 2008 at the Pennsylvania State Fair. So there was a precedent for this work. We actually enlisted the uh, official butter sculptor for the Ohio State Fair to fly in, make this one and a half uh, times life-size uh, bust of the president, and then we walked him from the meatpacking district where in a, a cold storage locker we had uh, had him created across the city to the cultural center where he resided from the week before the election until the end of the show. An unexpected byproduct of this piece was that because we used unsalted butter, butter sculptors can't use salted butter because it's too crystalline and will not yield the detail that's necessary. He started uh, to appear to have spots all over him. Uh, to the point where now he is completely covered. This we took yesterday because we completed the piece by moving him from the Chicago Cultural Center down to our new studio on the south side. And here you can see um, a member of the public taking an image of him yesterday afternoon uh, on the trip, the four mile walk that we took for the better part of the afternoon. Uh, down to his final resting place. So that's uh, a quick sampling of the way that we deal uh, with a variety of different kinds of public. So I have a I have a question for both of you, and it's something I'm curious about a lot too, in terms of um, in terms of when I you know when I make an exhibition or even when I write something, I don't always know how somebody responds to it. So part of what I'm curious about is when you when you have works that are, say, infiltrating, I like that word a lot, and I think I think it fits both of your projects in a certain way. How do you how do you know how who your public is and how that public responds to what you do? I mean some people will just tell you, but then there's presumably another large group of people who have encountered something and and there's no way for you to get any kind of feedback or reaction from that. I'm just curious how you think about that. We, we don't really, uh, 
obviously we work with multiple publics and so we're always interested when people approach us, sometimes years later after we've made a piece, we will encounter someone who, connecting the dots, will say, oh yeah, I remember that work, but uh, we don't necessarily have any kind of mechanism, nor do we necessarily think that it's particularly important for us to have some kind of uh, uh, data collection or gauge of what it is that we do. We make the work because we want to, and what's interesting is that uh, talking about an ephemeral public, a term that we talk about a lot for ourselves, is an accidental audience. And so for us, uh, very often, particularly with a piece like The Harvest um, that I just showed, we will encounter these people on the street who have no idea what's going on, and we'll talk to them. We're, there, there is um, no uh, wall for us to break. Part of the work is always going to be the engagement that we have with that accidental audience. Uh, we, you know, there's there's no differentiation for us between what we're doing and being out there in the world. In fact, it's really important that we are present and that we're absolutely willing to discuss any aspect of what we're doing. Yeah, it's a really interesting question, um, and I think that we all, you know, when you do art in the public, you really have no way of, under, of understanding how it was um, perceived or, or, um, or um, taken in. Um, it, not like in a gallery where you know if an artist or if a show is popular, or if people, you know, you know them, but people are coming and actually, if people are buying the work. So, on, on one hand, though, it's really great that we don't, we don't, not that we don't care, but we, our f primary uh, mission is to really, um, to uh, provide the the public with the voice of the artist. So it's really the artist that we are, that we're um, promote. You know, the artist's vision and and unadulterated, so really kind of unadulterated by the public. It's the artist's vision and then the public um, can take it or, or not take it. And we're, not, you know what, the success isn't relying on that. It's not like we're relying on sales or anything, so like that. So it's at, in a way it's very liberating not to care. But one thing that we do that is very important to us is that the work gets out there. So we use all the vehicles in all the ways that we can, and one of them is press. So we work very hard to get press, and it's not just for press' sake, but it's so that the story is in the New York Times, so so many people can read about it, and then have the option to go see it. So, um, you know, we work kind of within the structures that are available to us, even though they're not at all kind of the typical art, art structures. And just to piggyback on that, it's actually interesting as you probably can imagine, um, the Harvest piece with Obama was not necessarily because the Cultural Center is a city-owned building. And so throughout the run of the show, we did a number of projects uh, that involved us having lengthy discussions with various arms of uh, the city of Chicago government in various ways because they had never had to deal with a project that had so many tentacles and ask uh, the kind of questions that we were asking in some cases and what was interesting was that the city all of a sudden decided that they weren't going to um, promote that piece as part of the show. So we did it ourselves and we actually got all of the networks to follow us with cameras. It was on all of the local news programs. It was in all of the newspapers the following day. So we found out that we actually had to do the work ourselves uh, because there was a degree of circumventing of uh, uh, official channels um, who, um, while not uh, necessarily wanting to be obstructive, were um, just uh, um, silent. Can I, can I ask a question? Uh, can I ask you your question? If art imagines a public, what kind of public uh, does it or should it imagine? Like your question to at the end of your talk. Um, that's cruel of you to ask me my question. Um, it's something I've been thinking about a lot. I'm, I'm in the midst of organizing the next um, Made in LA exhibition uh, at the Hammer Museum in Los Angeles, what will be a biennial um, the moment it opens. It's the second version of that show. And I, it, I'm, I'm aware of how popular the first show was in terms of the kind of box office um, that 
that it did, and I, I, I don't usually think about those things when, I'm, when I've done shows before. I started to think about it last year, actually, um, in doing uh, the exhibition within Expo Chicago. I started thinking about different um, overlapping audiences, or perhaps uh, concentric circles of audiences from people who are, you know, um, understand the context of uh, who are very deeply involved in the art world to a more general audience. Um, and and the challenge, I think, is to, and it's one I think that all three of us are engaging in in some ways, um, to try to make something that's relevant to uh, uh, multiple audiences. The accidental audience, which I really like, as, as well as the kind of insider audience who has, say, a complete working knowledge of, you know, the entire history of biennials, um, or, you know, understanding of what it means to do a biennial in Los Angeles in a particular moment. Um, and it's, I think it's difficult to think about making a show for multiple audiences, audiences that you can't fully anticipate, um, but also one that's deeply intelligent and rewarding to people that are expecting the kind of challenge. Um, that a show like that can provide, or that a, uh, that a public work can provide, or a performance can provide. Um, so, yeah, I think that's the that's the question I'm in the midst of asking now, um, and I don't I don't have an answer, um, but it's a question that is propelling me right now, um, and it's made me realize how uh, I, you know I write for magazines like Art Forum, and you know that. Writing for art form is really for a fairly um, fairly small audience. It's really small in some ways, and um, and one writes in a certain language because one is writing to uh, an imagined audience, and it's it's an audience that um, uh, of people that I know and that I'll have conversations with um, outside of the framework of reading a review in a, in a magazine. Um, but of course, there will also be other people who, you know, pick up that publication and read that review. Um, but it's difficult to know who that is. And, um, but but I know with you know the context of doing a show at an art fair or doing a, a, a biennial that's up for three months at a, a museum in Los Angeles that um, there will be an audience that I can't fully anticipate. And I think that's one of the for me that's one of the exciting challenges of doing the show. Um, but I, but I, in some ways, I have to do certain things and then find out how it works um, after the fact. I can only speculate so much about how and if it will work. We should probably uh, open it up for questions, but before we do, I have a very specific question for you, Doreen. I have read recently, I think, that that Elm Green and Drag Set piece is being questioned by the Texas legislature about what it is, and, uh, um, you know, I think that this is interesting, too. Maybe uh, you can quickly talk about that if you know anything about the current situation. Yeah, it's very interesting, because we really didn't know anything about it, and it, uh, we just started hearing about it also through the internet. but. What happened was that the company Playboy, they wanted to do a project. Um, what happened really was, the whole story, is that Playboy came to us and asked us to do, um, they wanted to do a project, uh, a public project to engage in art. And of course, we embrace any, anyone that wants to support public art. So we said, yes, we will do, you know, we have a great project, we're working on a project. Um, right now, right outside of Marfa, uh, you know, Texas, because we've done Prada Marfa there, we wanted to create a few more projects there. And um, so, anyway, long story short, the way it happened was, we ended up not doing a project with them, but they ended up doing a project in Marfa. So they did a project um, there, and it was, uh, because it was Playboy, and they, they put the Playboy bunny uh, out there, which w when we did Prada Marfa, it, we did not get any sponsorship from Prada. It was all, we raised all the money outside of Prada because it was very important to the artist that it wouldn't come from the, from Prada because it was a kind of critique of consumerism and so it made no sense to be supported by, the, by consumerism. 
but Playboy it was for them that they, they were doing this installation, so they had the big Playboy money, and that riled everybody up, and everybody, you know, they, everybody there in the public got a, a very upset about it, and they ended up uh, uh, making it, making them take it down. I believe they took the Playboy of money down and that project down, but at the same time. It, they, you know, those same people kind of uh, got very excited, like, well, wait a minute, maybe Prada, Marfa is also illegal because it's also branding. I mean, they have a kind of, um, they're not supposed to do any any branding or any advertising advertisement along that road. So I agree that Playboys may have been over stepping over the line, but Prada, Marfa, you know, it, I guess it is a gray area, but it never, you know, that really wasn't ever the intention or, and it never kind of was that issue. So, well, I guess we're waiting to see now. Yeah, and, and I think that, you know, the, this after the fact engagement with an entirely different public or audience because of unrelated events is certainly also something that I'm sure that all three of us have experience with. So anyway, we only, I think, have a few more minutes because there is another panel after ours. So uh, I think probably we should open it up uh, for some questions, if anyone has any for any of us. No one? Yes, Jenny. that was not the audience uh, necessarily. I mean, that was a, a subset, and it was great working with this butter sculptor because he had been doing this for 30 years and was a fascinating guy. So it kind of emanated out from here. It does have a mention. Um, I, I think one thing that's interesting about the, the butter sculpture and that kind of, whatever, that, that kind of micro audience of butter sculptures is the, the transposition of that work outside of the fair and into a different kind of public sphere, however we want to describe the space that it's moving through. And in its, in its movement from something that might be seen as a kind of um, you know, the uh, 4-H fair kind of category to art with a capital A in some way. And I think, obviously, you're, you're interested in playing on that um, in a number of your works, um, and consistently so, I think, from what I've seen. But um, that, to me, is also something that's really exciting. It's something that's exciting to me about Capro's household from 1965 is that he decided to do an artwork at a city dump. It's not a space that confers art on something very easily, like a museum does or a gallery does. So, and you know, a lot of Doreen's projects are happening outside of the you know obvious spaces of art as well. And I think that's um, I think that's an exciting place to be operating. Um, but yeah, I think there is a kind of um, sense of trans evaluation or or things start sliding from one place to another. And that's that's a really dynamic place to be. 
in terms of in terms of audiences or values and expectations. I'm trying to destabilize those things whenever possible. that this is something that is coalesced and um, there are so many practitioners who work in these kind of ways now. Um, it's nothing that new, but it is interesting and exciting that it keeps uh, happening and, and propagating itself. And it's clearly embedded now, I think, in the flow of the way that art is made, that this is a paradigm uh, for which there is no question anymore. Yeah, I think there, you know, um, when someone like Daniel Viren started working in the, in the late 60s, it was seen as a challenge to the institution. Now I think institutions actively seek out these kinds of engagements and often have programs built around um, public engagement or um, some kind of uh, interface with, direct interface with an audience and, and um, uh, constructing communities uh, as a way that also upsets certain hierarchies in the museum, and that's built almost programmed into the, the DNA of most contemporary art institutions at this point. Anyone else have any other questions? Comments? Either of you want to add any last thoughts? Yes. <laughs> but I don't have one at the moment. Okay, well, let me thank my fellow panelists and all of you for being here and uh, enjoy the last few hours of the fair. And thank you to the fair for sponsoring this. <laughs>